Yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier the, the Mercury project. Can you tell a bit more about it? Uh, yeah. Tell me one second. Okay. Um, so uh, when we rehearsed that, I kind of thought that th that would be the part where you clap your hands for Josh. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good question, Amitai, actually, because the Mercury Project originated at a time when we had a lot of questions in the community about can Drupal scale. Um, you know, this was an, an unknown, and there was a lot of FUD going around, and... What that project was for me <laughs> was, was really, I didn't invent any of it. It was me just taking existing best practices from around the community and putting them together in a way that we could all kind of agree upon. And, and I think it, it, it basically, you know, I can't claim any real credit for it. It was just the, really the packaging of existing best practices that really delivered a lot of the value. Did, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah you know, I, I love that question. Um, it's a really, I actually, I really love that question. It kind of makes, I get a tingly... Don't, my wife is out of the country, so if that question and I could meet in the hotel room, like, <laughs> that's a, such a good question. Do you want to come up here and maybe like do some presenting with me? Yeah, it's kind of unorthodox, but sure. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Oh, why don't we? <laughs> I think it's really going to go better with you yeah, as part of the. I'm going to do. You know, I'll feel much safer and stronger. So, decoupled Drupal, what, why, when, and how? Uh, we're going to start off with where we have been, which is the monolithic architecture. Um, this is an architecture that has existed in software for decades. Drupal didn't invent it, but Drupal is a monolith. It's typically deployed as one big whack of code, and if you want to scale it, you deploy multiple monoliths horizontally, and it's all kind of plugged together in one application. And this is the way that a lot of software has been built throughout history, and there's nothing wrong with monolithic architecture. It is one of many ways that you can build applications, and it has some advantages in the fact that like, it's all self-contained, and you can train on one thing, and there's general consistency. This is like 2001 and the apes looking at the monolith, right? And you might say to yourself, Hey, now, that's not really true. We have a separation in Drupal between the theme layer and modules and core. Those are two different layers in the application. So what? take your monolith and shove it, buddy. And my perception is, well, it's true that we do have these different layers, but that's more a matter of convention than an actual architectural uh, a boundary. It's a highly permeable boundary. If you think about the way that module stuff can emit fully rendered HTML into the theme, and themes can run queries inside the template file, it's, a really, it's not like a strongly observed architectural saturation. And so when you have a, <laughs> a permeable boundary, you end up with an exciting and awkward game of chance as to what will happen. I told the joke. <laughs> <laughs> and what we find often is that Drupalisms uh, leak to the front end. Um, this is a recurring theme in, in the kind of work that we do, and one of the reasons that front end developers are sometimes so frustrated with Drupal. And you have to look no further than things like this, right? This is something that like all of us old hands in the Drupal, it's like, well, obviously, of course, it's telling me so much about what this template is doing. This is a rich, this is rich with data. But if you don't have all the lore of Drupal and the experience crammed in your head, this is nonsense. Um, this is kind of uh, uh, difficult to decipher. It's, it's, it's obtuse, and it's also kind of ugly. Um, and you know what happens in 2001 with the monoliths and everything else at the beginning of that movie? The apes get really ragey and they start smashing everything. And I think that explains some of our front-end developer community's behavior over the past several years. <laughs> you can sense that, you know, that, that things are boiling over in their heads. Um, and and I, I don't think that they're wrong. I think that they have a lot of legitimate critiques uh, of what Drupal has done. 
So in contrast to the monolithic architecture, we have a movement in the web, and again, it's much bigger than Drupal, but we could consider ourselves a part of that as well, which is the microservices architecture. And it's this idea that you can break down your actual application that you want to deliver to a customer into lots of smaller things that talk to each other and can be deployed and, and operated independently. And this has this kind of potential to be like more elegant and more flexible and potentially more scalable in certain ways. It has certain downsides in that you're going to have heterogeneous combinations of languages and platforms and debug things that are failing because of network issues is like the worst thing ever. But there's a lot of excitement about microservices, and rightly so, because if you think about an architecture that works like this, where there is a clear and distinct boundary between the client and the back end, the thing that holds all the data, and then the client that is uh, consuming that data, and it's talking over an HTTP API, you suddenly, a world of possibilities open up that would have been very difficult to imagine previously. And most importantly to me, um, as developers, it lets us collaborate in new and powerful ways with a wider audience of potential partners. Or you could say, everyone gets to rock their own jam. So I assume this was remedial for everyone in the room, but I thought it was important to mention so that we're all on the same page as we go forward, because this is a terrible idea. Um, so many things will go wrong if you decouple your site. The risks are just enormous, and they're huge, and they need to be considered. So for instance, Three words for you, baby. Search engine optimization. Um, it's no longer the case that like Google won't be able to understand your decoupled site because our page ranking overlords will execute the JavaScript and render the final results as what they tally. That's important also to prevent people gaming the system. So that's kind of cool. But in Drupal, we have all of these um, modules and contribs and extensions and the techniques that we've grown accustomed to, which are how we kind of create a compelling output for a search engine and things that happen automatically because the content has been entered correctly and the module have been enabled will no longer happen automatically. Um, so even though you don't have to worry about Google not understanding your site or having to have some weird static version of your site just for spiders, you're giving up a lot. You're giving up a lot. And SEO is really important for almost every site on the internet. Maybe not an internal dashboard, but anything publicly facing. This is a huge concern. And you're taking on that responsibility, whoever the front end developer is, to continue to ensure that all those bases are covered. And that's really a subset of a larger problem that occurs when you decouple from Drupal, which is you lose a lot of the value of Drupal. You leave it behind. So this is the I forgot my password form. Um, a quick show of hands. I assume we're all developers in the audience who, prior to coming to Drupal, invented their own quote-unquote content management system. <laughs> okay. How many people have written a I forgot my password routine? How awesome was that? <laughs> Not at all. Um, and so if you, 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 we, we can easily take for granted in our rush to decouple and get in with all like the sexy JavaScript stuff, um, we can take for granted all the things that Drupal has been doing for us, like providing very like stable and robust workflows for everyday things that every site needs, like what happens when the user forgot their password. Who wants to write this code again? Nobody. It's just not exciting. There's also this weird sense that in the community floating around that perhaps Drupal and like these new front end frameworks have just some kind of amazing plug and play aspect. And you know, you just turn on the REST API module and then put Angular on your front end and it all just, it all just kind of works. Um, and I mean, obviously if anybody tells you that, you, you know to like sort of like, huh? Because that's not even how Drupal works. Like you don't just plug and play. <laughs> everything together. Like, it's exciting. Like, it, as a kid who plays with Legos, this is the best Lego set ever, but it's like, you step on the Legos and it hurts your feet and you gotta hunt for the, you gotta trade with your friends. Like, I, I, need, a, I need a three wide, two long, well, I'll give you some castle walls for that. It, it's difficult. Um, and, it's, and it's only more difficult when we imagine a front end that is entirely, you know, is entirely ignorant of what Drupal is in and of itself. That plug and play capability will not be there and we shouldn't expect it to be there. That's something that we have to get used to is we want to en enter this realm of uh, decoupled websites or headless Drupal. And I start to think that maybe like we're just being led down this like you know, a path towards a, a rocky edge and this siren song of, a, you know, sexy user interfaces and, and new things and mobile apps. Like, this all sounds really cool, but we're, we're leaving all the beauty of Drupal behind and, and we're just going to all end up reinventing the wheel over and over again. We're going to just build these crappy front-end applications and, and it's going to be like we wasted the last 15 years of Drupal development. And I think maybe actually I just talked myself out of this whole presentation. <laughs> I think maybe... Well, yeah, I I think you're not talking straight, uh, really. I, I mean, I think you're a little dehydrated, so maybe sit, dip some water, and j you know, just give me a minute. Oh, okay. so okay.
So when we we're, so when we are talking about the couple Drupal, we're basically talking about there is a Drupal in the back end and some fancy JavaScript library in the front end. And when we're talking about the J the JavaScript world, then this to do app, this is like the hello world uh, example. That's the standard example. So what we've done here, we've taken the Angular JS example, we changed just one line, even that could have been avoided, and we hooked Drupal with a restful uh, uh, a restful resource in the back end. And this is probably an overkill, but this is just an example to show what we are able to do. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Form API is amazing. I mean, it's extensible, and you get security without even thinking about it, and Drupal is already providing you all the forms and, and everything. But we need to remember that that's 2015, and our clients, they want to have fancy UI. So sometimes, you know, the node forms are just, are just not enough, and they want to have, you know, to streamline the UI. And, you know, we could do it with Drupal. I mean, I, we all know in Form API limit validation errors, and we know that we shouldn't completely remove the title. We should make it invisible. And I know that there is the C tools, Ajax, that I can make those things. But let's say that the fact that I'm bold is 95% genetics and 5% related to Forms API. So. <laughs> So basically what we're saying is that form API shouldn't dictate the experience. It's just another tool in our tool set, in our toolbox. So instead of those bulky looking uh, Drupal forms, even though we're talking about decoupled Drupal, it doesn't necessarily mean completely decoupling. You can go that, uh, that route, but you can also have hybrid, meaning that Drupal is actually serving the page and we have like fancy looking AngularJS component that are communicating with the server through a RESTful, through a RESTful uh, interface. And actually, different interfaces that could not be done or could not be easily be done are now possible through this idea of decoupling Drupal. So again, this is 2015. These are what, this kind of dashboard is what our clients are expecting from. And again, maybe you're a super awesome themer and you could pull it off in Drupal and yet it's probably gonna be super complicated. But let's get, not get head, ahead of ourselves with new shiny UI JavaScript library before we are tackling this thing. This is a completely imaginary function. Even if you're not a developer, don't feel bad about it. It's basically a function that gets some entity and returns true or false, meaning it checks if the user has access to that entity. And that piece of code is working perfectly. There's no problem with it, but it's kind of violating some of Drupal coding standards. So let's look at the second version. We organized a bit the, the PHP docs, and we changed the true and false to be capital letter, and then we noticed that this four-liner could actually become, in version three, one-liner. And then in version four, we actually completed and we had, we add proper PHP docs and we even added a third argument called account because we are now thinking in a more API and this version four, which is acting exactly as version one, is perfect, right? If I would submit it as a patch, I will get all the glory and the money that we know that we get when we're submitting a patch. And any little typo over here, the wrong indentation, I will have to do it again and again. That's, that's the way we do it in Drupal. And then we enable a REST model, and bam, we expose our, our JSON, and Drupal is leaking all over the place. So we have this fill underscore prefix in the tags. We have NID, which, sig I mean, I don't know what it signifies if I'm not coming from the Drupal world. Oh, NID is a node ID, and see what is a node. I have to know all that information. So one of the things that we've done in RESTful, and this presentation isn't about RESTful, it's just showing those concepts, is trying to avoid the fact that I don't want the client who is consuming my API to even know that what we have in the back end is Drupal. You can imagine it could be Node.js, Golang, whatever. So 
when I'm looking at the data, I see that it's an ID. It's not an NAD, and it's not a title. It's a label. And another nice thing about the a thing that we have in RESTful, if we're going earlier, sorry, we saw API slash articles. One, again, I don't know if it's a node or not node. I shouldn't care about it. Another fancy thing that we have in RESTful is this slash API, which is actually the discovery of all the web services. And this is somewhat very similar to those PHP docs that we have, meaning I don't, as the consumer of this API, of this web service, I don't need to go to another site to figure out what are the different resources, what are the different endpoints. I can figure it out here. Or if I'm going to a specific resource, API slash article with the option HTTP method, I'm getting much more information, again, similar to this PHP doc, I'm getting the information about each property, which kind of data required, not required, even the form element. So basically, I could have a JS front end to dynamically create the forms that will, in the end, uh, create or update uh, the entity. And so what we're talking about here, uh, to take a step back, the reason to step through the code is this notion that aesthetics are actually very important for decoupling and because we're thinking about interfaces between clients and backends or between two different applications. And typically in web development, when you say interface or user interface particularly, we're thinking of something that's on the client side of the browser. That's, it's something between a human being and a website. It's like the web browser rendering HTML and making something visual that I can see and type and click. But actually, any user experience, any user interface is a stack. There's a stack of things that build up to being able to deliver that user experience. And I think about one of the things, um, um, and, and, and every output throughout this stack should be nice. And we care about this a lot in our own internal development, in Drupal core and in well-maintained contrib modules, whereas Amitai showed, we can be pretty particular about the structure of the functions and that functional signature and the way that you do the documentation. Because that's important. If we want to use those fundamental pieces to build great things on top of them, the interfaces that they expose, the way that they communicate further up the stack should be clear and should be expressive. And I think about one of the things um, my homeboy, Mark Sonnebaum, says when he picks a bone with PHP in general is that the biggest problem with PHP isn't that there's wonky things in the language and triple equals and variable, variable, candy flipping and whatnot. The biggest problem is that there's just a lot of code that's written in poor taste and that we don't have a great sense of aesthetics. And I think in internal to Drupal, we've got some of those things right. But I think as we begin to confront the headless Drupal, the decoupled Drupal movement, the possibilities, we have a chance here and now to get something really right so that we can build really beautiful things in the future. When we think about that layer, that when you stop playing Twister and start having a real um, interface between your back end and your front end, we don't necessarily just want to throw all of Drupal through that interface. That's not very kind to the people who are on the receiving end of, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, uh, communication. And if we want to empower people who will be on that receiving end, who are you know, developers potentially from other disciplines and other walks of life, to be very successful, we want to make it so that they can kind of understand what's going on and it feels good and natural to them, not that they feel like they have to go and learn Drupal in order to write a front end for it. Um, and I think if we can keep this consciousness as we begin to explore and develop how and when we decouple our applications, our future selves will thank us for it quite a bit. Because what we're going to build is going to be amazing, right? It's going to be like so uh, unbelievably mind-blowing. It'll be like we've gone through the looking glass and new things are possible and old people, you know, people will be saying, oh, back in my day, we used to have an admin interface and you would have to click every time something happened. And that will no longer be the case because we'll be, we'll be through the looking glass. And, and we really need to open our eyes to the possibilities, the insane possibilities of what's possible as we imagine Drupal's place in a wider ecosystem of software. And we are going to be opening our minds with the help of Amatai through JavaScript, not through drugs. Correct. <laughs> so... A year back in DrupalCon, uh, when we discussed headless Drupal, I was asking the question, or raising a question, which is, if I would tell anyone in the audience over here, a developer, a site builder, what is the proper way of creating a list of nodes in your Drupal site, then the de facto answer is views, because that's the standard. And then my second question is, what is the standard for, or which library should I use to do a login 
in a fully decoupled uh, headless Drupal, and obviously there was no answer because there's no standard. So what we've done is we've attempted to create such a standard through uh, a Yo generator, a Yeoman generator, which basically this is something that is used in the JavaScript world. We're typing Yo Headly. This is the name of this project. It asked me a few questions. It, what it's doing, it's actually scaffolds a full Drupal backend, a full uh, front-end client with AngularJS, with some nodes and examples, and it's ready to work. With, with, one, with one command, it's a fully working example, and what we're getting is actually, you're seeing here the client side, where I have this login, so this is in a way, maybe not the standard, the final standard that the community will agree on, but this is a suggestion, an invitation for the community to collaborate. Thank you. Yeah. Watch. And basically, you log in and you have this application which is working, and those markers are actually representing nodes. And this switch company is actually organic groups in the back. It's all those nodes and those different models that we're using. And this is actually opening the doors, uh, not just for the standardization, but also for crazy experiments. Like, for instance, when I as when after I've done it, I ask myself, well, I have a decouple Drupal, fully decouple, do I actually need the browser at all? Because, you know, I, I like working with the terminal, so I hooked up a few JavaScript libraries, and over here it's asking me, where is this Hadley Drupal sitting? I give it an answer, and I have this terminal. And the information you see here, this is real. This is going into the Drupal server, and it's asking it the information. And if I would change the location on the node, so it will be updated on the map. And seriously, if you, even if you have just 1% of geekiness in your body, this is experiment would probably make you super excited, even though this experiment is probably completely, absolutely useless. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe and I'm not sure, maybe there is some value in, in such an experiment. And I would actually go so far as to say there's a lot of value in this type of experiment. Um, because I think what we're act talking about here writ large is not just some awesome technical demos um, and some, some great stuff, and there'll be resources we'll post to the, the, the session so you guys can run Yo Headley in your own uh, sites. We're actually here to talk about the future of the web and Drupal's position in the future of the web. Um, I think that it is unquestionable that the future of the web is a world with an increasing number of APIs that are integrated, an increasing variety, variety of devices that are used. And if you think about the, I mean, if you're skeptical, you can look at the way that things are moving towards this sort of Internet of Things context. And there will be more and more things and people and devices and stuff out there both emitting and consuming data um, as part of the work that we are all involved in. And Drupal's place in that is different than Drupal's place in the past. Um, what, Drupal's p place is, is more as a hub and more as a connector and more as an integrator of these things and not as the monolithic Drupal does it all. I think if you had to ask yourself, if I were starting web development from scratch today, would I start with Drupal? And for me, it's very hard to answer yes to that question, to be honest. Because if I was starting web development today, I would start with some like crazy new JavaScript stuff, because that's where a lot of the action is happening. And you look at like statistics from GitHub, and JavaScript projects have the most active committers, the most active projects, the most sort of development work being done. And it's not like Drupal's fallen by the wayside or anything. The internet is growing, the number of web developers are growing, and people are uh, naturally drawn to the cutting edge of things. But if we think about the future of the web as one in which monoliths are are increasingly looking like dusty relics from the past, Drupal's role in this future is, is to be a connector, is to talk to different things. And that's why this model of decoupled Drupal or headless Drupal is so exciting. Um, and, and, it's, uh, uh, and it's an exciting time for Drupal because we'll be able to build more interesting things. I was actually 
It's funny, this guy over here is wearing a T-shirt. I was in Las Vegas uh, earlier last week, and there was a uh, Angular JS conference there. And I had a really interesting time talking to all the developers. They were showing, showing off some really awesome stuff. It was like, you know, offline data synchronization, so you could be disconnected from the Internet and use your app, and then when you got back on the Internet, it would sync everything up. Um, looking at, um, you know, tools to embed these, these uh, uh, UI that you build for the web directly into an app without having to go through some super bulky phone gap nonsense. Um, so there's a bunch of exciting stuff happening in that space um, and they're working out all these all these amazing problems but then when I talk to them about what they use for their back ends they're like well you know kind of got this Mongo thing that I hacked together or uh, somebody you know has just tried out this this node.js thing I, I hope it works and uh, there's a there's a real gaping uh, uh, you know, for, for everything that we're talking about where we want to standardize how Drupal becomes decoupled we want to standardize how we interface with front ends and and sort of make some of these questions settled on the front end development side they are desperately or badly in need of good solid answers for how to standardize on their back end needs and when I, I talked them, I'm like, oh, have you ever thought about using Drupal? They're, fr they're like, no, what Drupal? That's some kind of old website tech, isn't it? And I explain, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been around for a few years, okay, but it's, it's cool. Uh, <laughs> still got it. Uh, <laughs> But I explained, oh no, because there are actually quite good um, uh, interfaces now for Drupal that expose it as a as a REST API, good, you know, like ele elegant, expressive RESTful API. And if you use that as your backend, you know, you get an administrative interface for free because you usually had to build that at the last minute because you never thought your client wanted it <laughs> until, right? <laughs> uh, and, and you get something that's actually kind of battle-tested, that has like a, a pool of thousands of expert practitioners that can help you with it if you need that, rather than some custom hack sauce that you know, an intern put together for you. Um, you get some ability to utilize security, access control. There are back-end capabilities for doing advanced things like internationalization, even though you'll probably have to make your front-end smart to think about that. Um, and, and then they get really interested, like, oh, I'm going to have to really take this Drupal thing seriously. They don't even know that this stuff is possible. And it's because we are like, we're still in the early days of Drupal figuring out how it wants to be decoupled and what that means for other people. Um, and I think that this is super exciting because I think we actually can legitimately make Drupal, a, like as we talk about Angular and, you know, Yeoman and these other tools become weapons of choice for us, we can make Drupal a weapon of choice for the emerging front-end development community. And we can become good partners with them in open source. And that'll take us into new markets, it'll take us into really exciting use cases, and it'll let us build some really fun, freaking awesome stuff. And I think that that's, you know, as somebody who's been involved in Drupal for going on 13 years, um, the, uh, you know, I know a lot about Drupal at this point, maybe more than I want to know. And I know what I love about Drupal, and I know what I hate about Drupal. And it's okay to have things that you don't like about Drupal because Drupal is not amazing at everything. The, the, the kind of the, 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 the most uh, destructive expression of the monolithic mindset is that like you've got a Drupal hammer and everything looks like a Drupal nail. And that's not the real world. Like I think that's what's so great about what we've been doing with this latest release cycle of getting off Drupal Island and thinking about like decoupled architectures is that we realize that there is a much wider community that we're a part of. Like we are not the internet. We are an important part of the internet. And we recognize where we're strong and where we should actually look to partner with others to build things that are going to be, you know, more and more and more exciting. Um, so you have something important you want to talk about, yeah, though. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about live monitoring and visual regression for testing for a second. And bear with me for 70 seconds. It will, it will make sense. So one of the problems that we figure out we have in, in, in Gizra is that well, we write tons of tests, and we have Travis, and we do a lot of work to make sure that every commit is properly tested, and then we deploy our site on the live site, and then we just hook up Pingdom into it, or a similar system that basically just asks the site every minute, are you okay? It's getting a 200 response, and all is great in the world. But if something is breaking on the, on the site, you know, just because bad code, or even, you know, if the Hezbollah has hacked your site like they did for Drupal.org.il, Pingdom is telling you, yeah, sure, everything is fine. Well, I mean, what can possibly go wrong? And this is something that we figure out that we, we, we want to solve. So we've taken also this path of the visual regression testing. And the visual reg regression testing is basically, the theory is very simple. You take a screenshot of your site. Over here we can see a screenshot of um, 
a, twit a Twitter page, and basically we are removing this dynamic part or excluding them, meaning this, this black rectangle. And then I, we can compare it, these baseline images, to new screenshots we are taking all the time. And in theory, it sounds really, really great. But in practice, what we found out, that it's really, really hard. It, it's so hard that, in a sense, I think, well, we've, I think nobody's actually doing it. We didn't do it up until now just because it's so hard. And the reason it's hard is because, let's say, you're taking the baseline images of, let's say, 10 different pages, and you want to compare those pages on different browsers, on IE, Chrome, and Firefox, and you also want to check different breakpoints of responsiveness, and suddenly you have, like, 200 images that you need that you need uh, to maintain. So this shuv is about helping you to maintain those images so whenever there is a, a, a regression, which is a legitimate regression, you just change your code and you, know, you move the logo a bit in two pixels and this is actually the, uh, something fine, then you're able to select the new image and to create a pull request. It's tightly coupled with GitHub. And the thing is that this is super powerful. Uh, this is a super powerful tool, but nobody is using it just because it's so hard. So what we've decided is to have this shuv, uh, this shuv.io uh, fully open sourced project put out there, just so we try to get a solution and try to get a standardization, meaning the the uh, um, uh, an approval from the community that this is the right way to do it. And in a way, what we see about Shuv and what we see about Mercury and what we see about Headless Drupal, it's, it's kind of a mindset. So if we're looking at Mercury, so a couple of years ago, Josh and his folks realized that there is a problem, right? Or Drupal can't scale or is not fast enough. And what they've done, they didn't invent everything. They just bundled together different best practices and they contributed a few best practices and then 20 million dollars later we have Pantheon but it's not just Pantheon beca because in fact we have different hosting uh, uh, providers and actually Drupal itself is already using some of the information that we got there. So in a way all those problems that we have or we can actually call them challenges when we fix them meaning when we ever when we reach the point that the community has validated and validated them as a proper standard, then we actually can advance as a community. And once we solve it, we actually it leads to the to, to it leads us to the next exciting things. So right now, it's you know the couple Drupal, but once we'll solve it, once everybody in the audience, when we ask them what's the proper library to log in into uh, a fully decoupled Drupal, once we'll have that answer you'll no longer see five sessions about headless Drupal on every DrupalCon because the community will advance to the next exciting thing that we would like to solve. And so for those of you who were hoping to come to this session and hear Amitamatai and I explain exactly how you do all this stuff successfully every time, I apologize. Um, that was probably maybe our session title set a little bit lofty of an expectation. What we're trying to do is show what is possible and, and what is meaningful and what is worthwhile. And in the spirit of these other projects that we've talked about in the past, kind of a call to arms to standardize as a community on a way of doing things. And we're proposing certain values that we think are important in standardizing around the way that we'll do decoupled Drupal. The idea of an aesthetic and expressive API that it is in some ways uh, you know, the, achieves these values of self-documentation and so forth. We think that's important for us to gain traction. Um, the idea of building tools that allow you to rapidly scaffold applications, at least for prototyping and testing, so that we can put this power in more people's hands and not have to have them go through through a really long and painful learning curve to start to see some of the win. Um, the idea of putting together a compelling case for Drupal as a back end of choice, as a weapon of choice for the emerging front end use cases that are out there in the world. Those are all things that we think are fairly important if we want to see these types of use cases thrive. Right? We'll still, regardless of whether we, or not we do that as a community, like, regardless of whether or not, um, you know, I had I never put together Project Mercury, Tag1 Consulting, the ex, the true and acknowledged experts in performance, would still have been able to make any Drupal site scale. And whether or not we do this as a community, the, the great shops like Lullabot could still build you an amazing decoupled website. 
But I think we want to get to a place in the future where many of us are able to build amazing decoupled websites, where this is something that the Drupal community actually has down cold. It's not a question of this is like the cutting-edge rocket science that only superstars can do. This is something that all of us have our hands around, and we have accepted community best practices as to how you get started and the types of things you want to do. And so in terms of the, the, the conclusion of this, it's really a, a call to arms to all of you to join us, whether it's on the, the Drupal group, whether it's in a boff session here at the conference or whether it's just online on Twitter, you can tweet it up. Um, and uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce, this is Amitai. He's from Gizra. Hello. <laughs> and, this is, and this is, of course, Josh from Fantian. And, and we're happy at this point to take any questions if you want to go to the microphone there that we uh, showcased at the beginning. Somebody has to go first, because then it's easier for other people to go. If you can close the door, please. We have 10 minutes, and nobody's allowed to leave. <laughs> so, uh, is this on? It is. Okay. You're good. So, you touched on the uh, RESTful login earlier as a good example of something that we could potentially benefit from. Um, and it was funny because I was actually talking to a coworker earlier who was in another session and basically had that exact question of, you know, you're talking about APIs, what about login? And of course the answer is, well, Drupal handles that. And it's like, well, what if you're not using a Drupal front end? So it was really nice to see that this is a common problem. So what other issues besides login do you think we could potentially be encountering when it comes to headless Drupal that we can solve in a standardized way that maybe we haven't even thought about yet? Yeah, so tons of problems, basically. I think what just illustrated earlier with this silly example about forgot my password, you don't even think about it because, you know, when you install Drupal, it just works. And suddenly you need to take care of everything. So it's definitely headless Drupal is not the silver bullet that, well, everything will, will work properly. What we're trying to do in terms of standardization is that Instead of you know each company solving and reinventing the wheel over and over again, we know how to collaborate. We have the means of doing that. So whenever you solved it the first time, they forgot my password. We can all earn from that and basically be friends. So, I'll extend that a little bit. So Amitai is uh, a, uh, you know in, in the best way of the Drupal community doesn't try to promote himself. But the module that he and his colleagues created, RESTful for Drupal 7, I think really illustrates a better way of putting RESTful APIs on Drupal for the future because they have it has that expressiveness to it. It has a great developer workflow around it. It has the idea of versioning built in, and it's not just exposing Drupal uh, over JSON. And so I think that's something that we should think about for Drupal 8 because the, the core REST module doesn't quite go that far yet, and we'll have to think about as a community thinking, well, what if we want to do more than just expose Drupal's internals over JSON? We need to think about like good processes for making that easy for us to manage as developers. The other thing that I would throw out as a major challenge, and it goes back to Form API, is figuring out a way to try try to capture some of the value of Form API, especially from a security standpoint. So like coming up with standard ways to be able to deliver the Form token to the front end so that a submission can be validated on the back end. You probably want, you want client-side validation too because it should fail fast if stuff is missing. But from a security standpoint, that token validation process, if we can come up with like a dialed-in way that we all just use that stuff to solve data submission from decoupled front ends, that's going to save like hundreds of thousands of people hours over the next couple years as we build more of these sites. So we didn't discuss it, what, but we actually have a solution. <laughs> There's Entity Validate, and it's integrated with RESTful, and yeah, so it's there. Again, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying it's just plug and play, and it all just works, and we just No, 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 but that's, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. Nobody knows about Entity Validate, or very few people know. It's not like the views. It is the standard. It is the, the, the proven solution only once the community accept it as the as, as the accept as the proven solution. So, so maybe we'll try that more. Yes. So you kind of just answered my question, but I'll still say it just just in case. Uh, but so the call to arms that you just guys basically just had, um, asking you know we need to standardize these things. Is it? Are you? Where is the work to be done? Is, is the work to be done on exposing more things that Drupal can do to the client side, or is it standardizing the client side how we do things? It sounds like it's on the Drupal side. 
right? I, I, I think for the most part, it's on the it's well. Like, look, if I'm making the call to arms here at DrupalCon, like, raise your hands if you can you can develop Drupal really well, right? Now, raise your hands if you can develop decoupled front ends really well. So a few people. So the, <laughs> like, that's the audience, right? Um, and, 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 and so the thing is, like, the, uh, to be honest, if you look at, like, take a step back and look at the market, the front end space is just moving su- so super fast that, like, I don't think there are so few experts in this community of there. Like, at the Angular thing, they're like, they're getting ready for a major upgrade, but maybe Angular isn't even where it's at. Maybe it's all about Ember, or maybe it's about React, or maybe it's about Backbone. And, and all, like, these are all great answers. So... I think we just have to show what we can do and do so in a compelling way, first amongst ourselves to get our story straight, and then I think we promote it more so to the outside world. Like, I was really super stoked to see the to-do um, example that, that Amitai put together. That was just an idea that I threw out, like, six months ago, where I was like, hey, you know, if we wanted to really make Drupal and decouple Drupal uh, resonate with these people, there's, like, the to-do mvc.org or .io uh, webpage is, like, that is their standard. There's, like, 47 different JavaScript frameworks that you can implement a to-do in, but none of them include a back-end, right. right? And so if we can say, here's a way you can start to include a back-end in these kinds of things, then that's a very simple way for us to, like, take a, a, a non-trivial but still very bounded use case and learn ourselves what we want to do with it, but then also showcase that to the front-end community and say, hey, maybe there's something over here. And I think internally also one of the things we have to do as the Drupal community is raise up our front-end developers. Very frequently, front-end developers have kind of gotten a little bit of a short shrift um, and I think we need to reverse that. And that, that starts with all of us to say, we need to take the front end really seriously. That is where a ton of innovation is happening. And front end developers should be heavily respected within the Drupal community. So it's mostly on us. That's what I'm saying. And then if I could just spam, it, spam the mic one more time real quickly just for advertising purposes. But if people want to get involved in helping this kind of stuff, where do they go? Yeah. So I'm really good in delegating stuff. <laughs> You come to me, and six months later, when you provided tons of pull requests and stuff like that, we can talk about the next assignment. <laughs> um, we, there's, a, there's a group on Drupal. That are, I mean, this is one of the things where I, we've talked about this, and I've talked about this with other people. Like, there's a, there is a movement occurring, but it doesn't actually have a center of gravity yet. And that's one of the things maybe coming out of this conference we will create. So it could happen right here tonight. Well, probably not tonight. But tomorrow it could happen. I have a specific question on Shuv.io, the tool for automated uh, UI testing. Uh, what is powering that? And specifically, what is the algorithm behind hiding certain page elements from the comparison? Okay, I'll go over it quickly because it was just more about, the, I, even though I'm super excited well, about Shuv.io, I could talk about it one hour or less. I'll do the last <laughs> part. So basically, Shuv.io is itself headless, headless Drupal, but that's just an implementation detail. It's completely agnostic to the, to the technology you use to do this, this uh, visual regression testing. It's just a container for you to push the images. Sp- specifically, right now, it's integrated with WebDriver CSS. This is something that's an open source solution that's developed by Sauce Labs. And there are quite a few, if you go look, uh, we have maybe the links of the resources, or uh, we'll add it yeah. in the Gizra blog. There are uh, three different posts that shows repository uh, examples, code examples that you could use. Just start there, and if there are questions, you can tweet or catch me, and I'll answer it uh, directly. Sorry, thanks. So um, when you were talking about um, what would be the views of decoupled Drupal, I thought, I thought you were going to talk about, um, you know, views in the sense of lists of, you know, of results coming from a database or something. Um, we ha- has anybody here used XJS? Um, we've used it a lot. And I think it has, first of all, a very, a pretty mature decoupled data exchange model, you know, between the server and, and the client and caching or and bidirectional uh, exchange of data and so on for multiple providers. And it also has a pretty nice forms, sort of an equivalent of the client-side forms API. And it's an open source project. So it's just, um, it, it would be an interesting thing to look at for what, what you're thinking about um, for this community. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have a back end, by the way. Yeah, so even though I, I, I think uh, highly of myself, I'm still not a community, meaning 
the fact that I'm standing here doesn't mean that I give the, the, the validation to things. In a way, it's like everything in uh, open source, it's the popularity. So if people, right now, Angular is the popular, what would be the next thing? I don't know. So, and I think people will consider it only when they're real examples. So if you think about it, if you want to use another JavaScript library, go ahead, hook it into, into a Drupal backend, put a, b a blog post, and then we can start talking about the smaller details. I, so outside of this community, I've spoken to other people who have negative impressions of Drupal based on previous experiences they've had or things that other people have said or blog posts that they've read that a lot of the time are out of date or maybe they are you know, true. Um, what's a way we can piggyback on up and coming cool stuff like Angular and get Drupal out there again, the Drupal name as something that people want to use I think we'll do that by piggybacking on cool stuff like Angular. <laughs> uh, um, no, but seriously, that, that's part of the opportunity here. I, I think that um, tactically we, we need to showcase more of the capabilities. I think that we need to present Drupal. And that's one of the reasons, again, why I, I love the RESTful module, because I, it's the first time I've seen something that presents Drupal in a way that front-end people will actually be enthusiastic about rather than grudgingly accept, perhaps. Like, uh, and that doesn't just talk about like decoupled use cases. Like uh, the, from the keynote this morning, the Mark Bolton redesign of Drupal 7, do you remember like the epic rant about how there were just too many divs and he couldn't even, can't, I can't even. And, and it's because, like, you know, for, for me, I'm more of a back-end developer. I'm like, nah, it's just some extra divs. It's not really doing anything. But um, to a front-end developer, that's just like, you've just like, yeah, I, I, let me just put extra keyboards on your desk and, like, pile some shredded paper. You can still do your work, right? And, uh, and it's not good for them. It has, it's a bad experience because there's all this cruft in their way. And so I think for us it's about showcasing that Drupal can be a really fun thing for front-end people to work with and then building some really sexy examples like, uh, that go beyond the to-do. Like the, the example I think where you showed with the Headley hooked up to the terminal, that like you got spontaneous applause because, whoa, your eyes, your pupils dilate when you see something like that. And, uh, and that, that's true for, for front-end developers too. And, and with examples like that, we can grow our community. We can start getting more people from the Angular Vegas conference to come to DrupalCon and build those. I'm, I hate to keep calling you out. It's just ironic. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we can build those alliances, build more cool stuff. Cool stuff turns into blog posts and tweets. Blog posts and tweets turn into more people looking at it. And that's just, you know, that's the virtuous cycle that we want to have in an open source project. So we got to just execute, basically. Hi. I'm brand new to Drupal. And we are thinking of going with Drupal 8 headless and also deploying an application in a headless mode which is we have our Angular apps deployed on our ships and on the shore sites. So we don't know whether Drupal 8 is the right way to go, but we're thinking by looking at all this and all the sessions that we have attended, Drupal 8 is the way to go because, as you mentioned, there is no good backend, even though you have a good UI or good presentation layer, but there is no good content management thing. So do you think like it's a good idea to go with that? Yeah, I think if you're build, like unless you're planning, if you're planning to launch in the next month, Drupal 8 might be a risky decision. But it sounds like you're just starting now, so that's probably that you're going to have a multi-month development cycle, and you're going to be able to, to take some time through that. And Drupal 8 does include in the core of Drupal um, a REST module that's OK, um, and it, it does a lot of great things out of the box. More importantly, I think, for this context, that's a proof of concept. I would look at the REST module and core as kind of like proof of concept implementation of what having a real HTTP router in Drupal is. And there's like a ton of possibility. Like I, I spent a lot of my, um, the last couple, two three years actually writing a bunch of Python code because I had to write a giant API uh, with my team at, at Pantheon. And the, what you're capable of doing when you r are writing with an application that actually talks HTTP rather than responding at paths with blobs of HTML is like light years better. And I, you know, you, you've basically backported a bunch of this functionality with the RESTful module to 7, but I think having it in core in Drupal 8 will allow us to build, you know, that's kind of like we're building for the future with that. So I think if you're thinking long term about your application, you are in a good space to be thinking about Drupal 8. Do you think like it has a good push mechanism using like an ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, or something like that? Uh, what you'll need to do for that, yeah, you 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 need something else. Uh, uh 
Yeah, so if you can push to a Q or you push to like a, a – a, 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 you can push to Redis, you could push to Node. Um, there are a bunch of people that do push notifications off of Drupal sites. That's a fairly common use case at this point. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, two, last two questions. Hey, guys. So um, there was the real maintainer of RESTful model. I'm just taking the credit, but this is the real maintainer of RESTful model. <laughs> Matteo from Lullabot. So my, my question is that um, I saw a slide that I like particularly, uh, but then when you said that decoupling is not such a great idea because you're missing things like, I don't know, uh, translating your UI. We have the T function, but we don't have it when we, when, when we decouple. So, um, and on the other hand, uh, we talked about uh, getting an API that is Drupal agnostic, so we can separate all these concerns about how to do things. So my, my question is, uh, we are getting this conversation started on how to make these standards on doing these, these problems, like logging, uh, passing in meta tags back and forth, or translating the UI. But at the same time, we're saying that we are not going to be opinionated on what the backend is, because we're building good API. So where should these communication channels happen to, to get the, like, all these cool JavaScript technologies like React, Angular, whatever. I realize that I said that Angular is cool again. But yeah, so w where should this happen? Uh, should this happen at a DrupalCon? Should this happen at other higher spheres or so I, I think that there's a conversation that we're trying to start, or really we're trying to continue. This conversation is already happening. We're trying to continue and, and energize this conversation that happens here about what our role as Drupal is in this, and, and our role as developers who maybe can also learn these new front-end frameworks. And I think that we are, it's maybe a little bit early for us, uh, but soon, if we can get our, our story together and get our demos on straight, then we can actually take this conversation to those communities and we can start reaching out to them. We can say, hey, look at this example. What do you think? Could you build a better example than this using this back end? And I, there are a bunch of tricky uh, things about how much we want to standardize. I, one of the things I would throw out as an idea is one of the things that won't work is we try to figure out all the problems right away. Um, we should probably pick a subset of the most common problems and then find like the intersection of the highest value and easiest to solve and just focus on nailing those so that really like we can take a, a serious step forward um, rather than trying to imagine the ultimate way of doing uh, decoupled Drupal or the ultimate answer to all the questions of what do you do with the missing functionality from the Drupal backend. Yeah. I don't know if you... I told you you just need to invite me to Mallorca and we can discuss it uh, <laughs> over there. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Josh. I think, I think what, what we're doing with RESTful, for example, is trying to set the standards uh, by, you know, just putting it there. And, we just, and I think we reached the point that the community is already picking up RESTful and we're seeing more pull requests and stuff like that. So if nobody asked us about translation, Maybe there isn't such a need yet. So I, I don't know. I, I, we're on the same boat there. All right, last question. All right. Thanks. Okay, so last year I was in the BOF with you. Yeah. I was there. And uh, I talked about a Drupal 7 site that I was building at the time that was using Headless. Um, and so that's launched since then and it's been successful. Um, I think rather than, this isn't a question, this is more of I wanted to give some ideas around why, what will help us promote. This is, uh, you know, I think like you're talking about making Drupal kind of like a standardized back end for, for this sort of stuff, uh, is selling the, the idea of, and I know this is kind of counter to how Drupal is intended to be used, is c content and configuration living together. The power of field, the field API um, and the UI behind it with content gives you the ability to quickly and rapidly build a backend that can expose how you want the front end to render it. Um, and I love what you're talking about with, with basically turning uh, Drupal into a, a neutral API that doesn't expose Drupal but exposes the content 
Um, and in the same way, the configuration can be exposed in there too. Um, I think one of the greater things that we need to deal with is routing. Routing is a big problem because people want to be able to route things a variety of ways and you've got Drupal zone issues with you know, how the paths are generated and you've got to be able to expose that in a natural way to the front end. So having a, a, a lockdown standard for that I think would get us really far because that was one of the questions that people were following me and around and asking me was how do you deal with routing? How do we know what nodes, how do we get, you know, how do we have pretty URLs that make sense and work with path auto and all this good stuff? You know, and you have to think about it. It's not hard to do, but you have to, you know, having those answers, that, that's, that's something we need to have locked down. And I'm glad that you've handled login because that's another question I got asked today actually but for this. How'd you deal with login? Well, I actually never got around to it. I didn't need to, um, but I'm glad you've done that because that gets back to form API, you know? Having a uh, solid documentation behind how we integrate with web forms or entity forms or whatever, we need those things. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree, but this can all be only be done not through theory, but through you know people sitting, geeking out, and Absolutely. producing code, yep. and others reviewing that, Absolutely. and that's how standards are created. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, those are some of the things that I think we need to work on, and uh, yeah, I, I solved some of that in my own projects, but I was Drupal 7. Um, I didn't use uh, uh, REST WS. I actually wrote my own module that does something similar, but I love REST WS too for other things, so this is all good. And I mean, it's awesome to see this went from a little box in a tiny room to you doing a presentation on it. Who would have imagined? <laughs> it's awesome. So, so let's keep it going. Yeah. No, obviously, this is, again, we'll keep this conversation going. We're happy to chat not on microphone with people. And uh, otherwise, you know, people want to get up and stretch your legs. You're free to go now. Thank you again. Thank you. Do the dance again. Yeah, you were in the zone. That's cool. I think that worked, pretty, worked out pretty well. Well done, sir. I think it was, uh, yeah. First time we're yeah, okay. it's first alive. Time I'm just glad you guys had all the yeah. 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 to see you. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. uh, so I have only one thing I am actually sure you're aware of. Uh, did you see the blog post that we did? Okay. Yeah, what uh, the Drupal cake and the lie thing? So I think yeah. it's the lie. That was why I put the cake and the lie in, I, in the first slide. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sorry, you guys are also excited about the possibility of GraphQL and that lie and tail. Yes. But the thing is that GraphQL. Everybody's always excited about the thing that doesn't exist yet. It is? Well, it does exist, I mean, but do a limited extent. Yeah, 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 it's absolutely. kind of. So the idea is, and, and we know that Red Bull is 